I'm going to change gears a bit. <clears throat> this past weekend, Blanche and I went to Seattle to say goodbye to a very good friend who was part of the ashram back in the Rudy days. And was very close to Rudy. She was really <clears throat> someone Rudy loved deeply. She used to sit with him and he would dictate talks to her. Her name was Barbara Boster Phillips. And she had breast cancer for the last 10 years. And about six months ago, they said, there's nothing more we can do. And Barbara has woven in and out of Blanche's in my life for four decades. And saying goodbye to somebody is incredibly difficult. I don't know how many of you have had to do that, knowing that you're having a last, a last moment. We went to see her on Saturday and we spent about an hour together and she had not let many people in. She had kind of stopped wanting to socialize with people, but she wanted to see us. I kind of thought she wanted to have a little spiritual discourse, but what I realized the minute I walked in the room is she wanted to see Blanche. <laughs> I mean, I was there, but she wanted to see Blanche. And they just sat, and they just held hands, and they talked. And, you know, Rudy said something about Blanche right in the beginning of our relationship. He said, she is a deep well. He even described her as one of the deepest wells that he had known. And I could feel Barbara just drawing and drawing and drawing from that well. It was really unbelievably beautiful, and Blanche being absolutely available to that. And we had our moment. I had the, you know, the spiritual words that I think often want to be said. But what's really wanted in moments as you approach finality is something unspoken. It's really what we talk about now in this class a lot. It's called presence. Presence to be present. We knew on Saturday that we got to come back on Sunday, and Sunday was a really hard day. We woke up in the morning, both of us feeling really like we didn't want to do this. We didn't want to go, but we wanted to go. And it was understood that she wouldn't have enough strength until late in the day, so we went around 3.34. And we arrived at her apartment, and her husband greeted us, and he said, you have two minutes. She can't sustain more than that. She had had a stroke. She was now paralyzed on her left side. She supposedly would have trouble speaking, but she didn't have trouble speaking with us at all. Not at all. And she was so open and so available and so in flow and so loving and so grateful and so full of life for somebody who was in the last hours of her life. And it was so beautiful to be with her. And, and this time she seemed to want the words, or at least the words came forward. The words that always seem to arrive when I've dealt in situations like this are fairly simple. It's really trust the journey. Something else that works, although I didn't use it, is the 23rd Psalm. Really powerful, very beautiful thing to tell people as they're leaving this world. So 
So we had two minutes. And we held hands. We acknowledged that this was the last time we would ever see one another. Except the words from the movie Ghost kept coming up. Uh, you know, the love inside, you take it with you. And uh, the last words in Ghost are, see ya. Which really meant a lot. Really, really, really meant a lot. But her last words to us as we were leaving, and they were the words that encapsulized a life of being a spiritual seeker. Someone who had worked her whole life, she had never let go of a practice. Although she stopped meditating. I'll get tell you that. She had a whole midlife of alcoholism. <laughs> kind of an unexpected thing. And, uh, and then 12-step program to get out of alcoholism. And someone who truly imbibed 12-step program. I don't know how many of you know that program, but it's as beautiful a spiritual program as exists in the world, I think. And I've watched so many people really come through enormous battles and struggles using it. And she did. But Rudy was always front and center. <coughs> Rudy's picture was there all the time. She had gorgeous tankas around her rooms. And she was a Rudy student, really, every moment. And you could feel that in her life. You could just feel the sweetness, the joy that percolated through her life. And I won't go through the narrative of her life because that's not important. What's important is the being that she was. And the being that she was was encapsulated in her last words to us as we were walking out of the room. She went, toodaloo. <laughs> and that was absolutely Barbara, absolutely her. You know, I mean, you keep waiting for the big word, the big moment, the big finale. And it was beautiful. It was truly beautiful. And uh, we've been very sad in the last week and missing her. But, you know, Blanche and I have been through, as you, those of you who've <laughs> watched our talks, the, the, these talks at all, or who know what's going on, you know, Blanche and I are letting go of the farmhouse in upstate New York, which is going to mean, mean that we're here a lot more. Um, for better or for worse, <laughs> but we're going to be around. But we're letting go of what is for us a kind of paradise. It's a really beautiful, beautiful place. It's the most beautiful place I have ever seen on the planet. And somehow I got to buy it and own it for 15 years. And I'd hoped that I would have it forever. And I was kind of surprised that the turns life began to take that made me realize you can't hold on to it all. You, you, you can't. And, uh, and we had choices to make, and I have to say, they became agonizing. I mean, really painful. And not knowing what to let go of. We could let go of this house. We could let go of that house. We could let go of both houses. I mean, there were lots of choices, but the one thing we couldn't do is hold on to everything. Although we tried at various points to figure out how to, how to do that. But, you know, financially, this place was a big drain, and as I was coming into what I call the fixed income portion of my life, the idea of watching that income pay what I called school taxes. The school taxes there were $60,000 a year. And so I kind of magnified that by however long we would be there, and that was, my God, $600,000 for 10 years, that would pay for my granddaughter's multiple college educations, and rather than paying for the Hyde Park School District. Mm -hmm. So I just said, this is crazy, it's crazy to hold on to this most beautiful place on the planet. And, uh, you know, there was one point where we had finalized our decision, and then I did this really stupid thing. I opened it a crack, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said to Blanche, what if, what if we change our mind? What if we don't sign the contract for this house? Because it was basically sold. Mm -hmm. and, and, she, and I said, would you want to stay? Yes! <laughs> Immediately, yes. And she walked right through the door into owner, owning the, staying in the property, and so did I. And then the intensity of the wrongness of that choice started to build up inside. It was so hard. It was so painful. I mean, I even talked to the realtor and said, look, I may have to deprive you of your, of your, of your fee. And he said, look, he was, he was quite beautiful. He, he just said, 
It's not in my hands. You know, the universe knows what it's doing essentially. And he was totally open to the fact that we might change our mind. And then simultaneously, about a week later, both of us, really uncomfortable for a lot of different reasons, both said to each other independently, we need, we need to sell this. We need to do this. I've talked about this in some of my classes in New York, but you know, I've had struggles with this place because I've had to work so hard to keep it going. I, I've had to, it used to be that I would have to write a movie a year to pay for it. Then it got to be two movies a year to pay for it. And, uh, and some of the movies I had to write, I didn't want to write at all. They were insane projects, truly insane, with some very big movie stars. But I just couldn't do it. And, uh, and so I would be angry at the property for requiring me to work so hard <laughs> to keep it going. So everybody thought I hated the place, but that was not true. And what I decided as we approached the end was, you can't leave somewhere struggling with it. You have to love it. You have to love it. And I just opened up, and it wasn't hard, to how wonderful and beautiful and special this place was. And if you want to know real pain, leave something you love. But I'm telling you, it's the only way to leave. The only way to leave any part of life is to love it to death, to love it to pieces, which is what Barbara was doing. She was loving life, every molecule of life, and she was leaving it in love with it. And she was teaching me every step of the way. And so I just understood I have to leave this place loving it. And it's nothing like what Barbara did. Barbara left everything. We just left a house. We're leaving a house. But it's incredible practice, because I'm telling you, every one of us, everyone in this room, has to arrive at a place where you can say goodbye to all of this. And in a funny way, meditation is the practice for that. And it makes meditation sound kind of glum. You know, it's all about learning how to die. But, you know, I used to do so many interviews for Ghost and other things, and people would say to me, why do you always write movies about death? And I would always have a stock answer, but it is the answer. Because it's only through embracing death that you get to know life. And the real teaching is, when you understand that at any moment you may be dying, life becomes what it is, which is precious. Totally, remarkably, unendingly precious and you don't get to hold on to it at all. The key words in our practice are surrender. Help me to surrender, which is <clears throat> surrender to the incapable po possibility of holding this ephemeral, ongoing, changing, transforming experience that we're all in. It has no substance that you can grasp. It is slipping through your fingers and slipping through you every second. And its beauty is in its passing. And only when you understand that do you get to live it. But it's not just an understanding of it. It's a true experiencing, or if you will, being with that. Living it. Part of my uh, operation that I had, and again, some of you have been listening to these talks. Uh, you know, I had this operation, but I didn't talk about something that happened after it, which happened the last time I had an operation. And this happens to many people who have operations that are below the belly button. <laughs> these were both, it was a prostate and a, and a bladder. And uh, what happened was that they discovered I had a almost foot long. Um, uh, uh, blood clot in my leg. And, and it was on a Friday afternoon and there was, it was either go into the hospital or get these horribly weird shots that Blanche has to give me in my stomach uh, in order to thin your blood very, very rapidly so that you, uh, so the blood doesn't clot and you don't, it doesn't, the clot doesn't break off and go into your heart or go into your lung or go into your head with the understanding that if it did, you, you would die and you would die very soon. And so, there you are, <laughs> there I was, with this understanding that in the next three days, this 
before this all took hold, I could, I could die. And, you know, it didn't wake me up, it just affirmed the awakening. It just affirmed what I knew, that at any moment this could go. And it was, and still is, an extraordinary way to live. Just knowing this moment is the one you got. <laughs> and then, just the other day, I had a, a dental procedure. I know this is all very medical, guys. Sorry if this, if this is really a little too much for you. But I had a medical procedure, and in order to do it, I had to stop this thing I'm taking called Coumadin in order to, take, to, have, to let them go in and let bleeding occur. So I stopped it, and then I went to have my blood levels checked, and they said there was no thinning in my blood at all. It was completely clotted, and I got a 6.30 in the morning call yesterday that if I don't do something very quickly, that clot can break off again for the first three months, and I can, I'm in exactly the same place that I was, so I had to run to the pharmacy and get these shots, and Lance has been giving me the shots. And, and so, again, I'm right, I'm right this second in that same place that I was before, which is, I'm no different than Barbara or anyone else. You, we're, all, we're all with what we call <laughs> a second away from leaving this world. And rather than have it be terrifying, it tells you the truth. The truth is you have this moment. My granddaughter is here. You may have run into her walking into the house. Uh, I've never known love. I mean, I've had lots of love in my life. But the purity of the love that comes from that little child, there's no, there's nothing, nothing that interrupts the purity of it. Nothing. There's no agenda in it. It's just love. And I, we were talking the other day, we were sitting on the railroad tracks, which we do all the time. We sit and watch the trains go by because it's her favorite thing. And we take these little twigs on, we draw faces on them and stones, and we have all these friends that we talk to, and we just play and have the best time ever. And we could sit hours out there, and sometimes we do. And I asked her a question. I said, I said, Talia, where do you think you came from before you were born? Where were you? And she said, I don't know. And I said, I don't know either. I don't know where we come from. And I said, I think it's like nothing. I think it's like nothing. We come from nothing. And she kind of looked at me, you know, looked at me. And I said, but I love you so much, I said, that clearly love comes out of nothing. So nothing must be full of love. So I think we come from love. And I think we go back to love. And she went, oh, oh. And it was like a truly early understanding for a little child, but it's probably better than what my mother told me, which was we, death, she said, was going to sleep and never waking up. And so I, would, I couldn't sleep for years. And, and I kept thinking, how do, you, how do you not smell the coffee in the morning? I couldn't imagine never, ever, ever not smelling the coffee. So I wanted to implant in her this idea of something really rather, rather beautiful. But the fact is, I think it's true. It's not an idea. I think we come from something, from nothing that somehow has as its, I don't know if it's its core, but it's its most beautiful creation, which is love. We come from love. And I think we return to love. And I described, again, forgive me if those of you who've listened to the talks, but I described an experience I had after my operation when I was back home and lying in bed one night and kind of struggling a little bit with sleep. I don't know what I was doing exactly. Suddenly, this man appeared and sort of took my hand and he led me to this little room. I don't know, I can't describe it, but it was very meager. And it was kind of wooden and it was not particularly beautiful. And it was kind of a sanctuary of, or a citadel of some kind. And it was, and he, wanted, he took me into the room and I knew as I was going in, whether he told me or whether I just knew it, I was entering the Holy of Holies. And the first thing that I saw was this very shabby place, kind of like the manger, you know, in, in the Christian teaching. It just didn't have grandeur about it at all. 
and in the back of the room was something like a crucifix or a Buddha kind of hanging, kind of lopsided on the wall. Didn't matter. Something in me heard this voice that said, fall to your knees and behold. Truly biblical words. And I, I did. I fell to my knees and the experience that took place in that moment, in that simple, humble place, was so total, overwhelming, beautiful, absolute, and bigger than anything one can envision or imagine in life. It's so enveloped. It brings you to a kind of tears where you can't even cry. It's beauty beyond beauty. It's love beyond love. It's truth beyond truth. And it's wordless, and it is incredible, and it is humble. And then I'm in this state of being that is indescribable and beautiful and I had to go to the bathroom. And I woke up with this pain. And I was really grateful in a way because everything stayed so vivid. And I walked to the bathroom to pee. And as I'm walking, this voice said, you can't hold on to beauty. You walk in beauty. It's everywhere. There's no need to possess it. You can never leave it. And it was talking to me about, in a way, selling the house, letting go of Barbara, letting go of life, everything. And it was like the deepest teaching and so extraordinary. And the depth of me knew it was true. The ego mind, the next morning, woke up and tried to hold on to it and say, okay, I can sell this place. <laughs> I don't have to hold on to beauty. I'm walking in beauty. You know, the mind takes it and just diminishes it into nothing. But the truth of it was also present. And it's there now. And I just want to share it because I don't think that experience is unique to me. I don't think this idea of presence is unique to me. If anything, the one reason I sit here week after week or in New York is because all I want to do is get each of you to awaken to your own presence. That's my entire goal. Not to give you a spiritual teaching, not to sit here and pontificate, not to somehow say I have it and you don't, you know. All I want is for every one of you to know you have it. That's all I want. If I can leave this world having in some way helped you find this truth, that would be a life worth living. It's so interesting to me because, you know, I've had a career which is now, in my mind, over, although it keeps creeping back. But, I, but the satisfactions from my career are so small, so small. And the satisfactions from sitting with you are so big. The satisfactions from hugging my wife, my children, my granddaughter, and each of you are so great that this resume thing that we all build up in our lives is not the answer. And thinking that's going to be the thing that's going to give you anything but some cash, which will never be enough, I promise you that, ever. It will give you, it gives you a little bit of temporary comfort. But what's one thing you realize really quickly when you hit the age of 70 is that all that acquiring, all that attainment is so transitory. It has so little ability to define who you are. That what you are is what happens when you let go of that stuff. Who you were in the accumulation. Who you are as a person who is living in this world of fantasy and phantasmagoria because it's all it is it's this vast wonderful dream of such power and deliciousness and terror but it's all of that stuff but all that falls away and what doesn't fall away what doesn't go away you don't go away you do not disappear everything else falls away and you are left standing but what is that you? Because it doesn't have a name, and it doesn't have a story, 
It doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. It is infinite and endless, and it's you. You. <laughs> you know? Get rid of the idea of the me, and know that it's you. In the most powerful, fundamental sense, there is this presence in you right now, listening to this talk, that if you don't think about how it affects you, if you just listen, if you're just present with it, you're there. You're there. You, you're it. And all any Zen master wants to do is take that stick and go, this is it. This is it. Not that. Not what will happen when you leave here. Not what took place two years ago. Not the problems you're dragging along with you. No. Drop all that right this second and be what and who you are. And do, what do you have to do to be that? Nothing. You're it. You're it this very second. You are the very thing you're looking for as you sit here. And it's the oldest teaching in the book. I'm not saying anything that any of these teachers haven't said from time immemorial. You are free of you right now if you want to be. Now, of course, it's not that easy and kind of there's got to be like, like a, a divine blessing that, that suddenly goes and cuts away the past and the future and just says, here. But working yourself to that place, hungering for that, asking for that, saying to the universe, I am willing to live that, they hear you. They hear you. But you've got to announce your, your desire. You've got to announce what you're looking for. If this is a casual and occasional thing, you will just be caught up in the drama of life until you die, and that dying thing will not be fun, because they're going to take away everything that I'm suggesting you let go of now. They're going to take it all away, and they're not going to take it away with you in a very happy condition. It's very hard to have it yanked out of you. You know, it's the difference between going to the dentist when a tooth, or being a child, you know, a tooth is hanging by one thread, and they go, Pip! you know, it may hurt a little bit, but take a pliers and try to take out one of your teeth, and it's a whole different experience. Most people die with pliers, <coughs> trying to break you out of this idea of who you are. It doesn't have to be that way. It can just be click. That's all it is. And you can do it right now. Now don't sit here and be, be upset with yourself if you don't do it right now because yes, it takes a kind of a kind of willingness, a deep, profound willingness to let go of you, to die to yourself. Because that's what happens. You and your story just kind of don't matter anymore. But do you think that's going to be terrible? Oh my God, I'm gone. <laughs> it's the most wonderful thing that could happen. Trust me, you are the burden. <laughs> you are the problem. You are everything you don't want. <laughs> and if you just let it go, you're free. Boom, finished. You don't have to carry it along with you. <clears throat> Every day, you know, and go, oh my life, you should know my life is so horrible, it's so terrible. You know, who wants to know that shit? You know, and yet you, you muck around in it all day long. You know, oh my, it's even worse here. Oh my God, you know. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's just a story. It's a story. It's a story you have believed, and it's a good story, and you don't have to pretend it didn't happen, because it's a story that has enormous instruction, value, and intelligence in it. You gain from it. You really gain from it. But don't believe it to be ultimate truth because it's just one story. And if you want to know stories, go to the bookstore. Look at how many stories are out there. They're just stories, you know? And yours is just one more. And it's going to come and it's going to go. But what's not going to go is the storyteller. The storyteller is forever. Forever. So, you know, we have lessons to learn. Barbara taught us, Blanche and I, enormous lessons, and a lot more people than that. She had so many people who loved her and so many friends, and she had AA meetings in her house, and people gathered by the hundreds, and, you know, she left people all around the world who just loved her to pieces, and uh, it was a great life. It was a great life. She taught Blanche and I how to let go of what we think of as paradise. You know, walking out of paradise is not easy, but I'm walking into this. This is not. This isn't shabby, <laughs> you know. This is pretty good. Pretty good. It's minus 149 acres, but but it's a lovely. It's a lovely place. And I got you guys, 
But let me, let me tell you something about that. And I'm going to end on this. I need you guys to be here. I need you guys to be hungry for this. I almost need you more to be hungry than to be here. By that I mean, this spiritual thing doesn't happen by a casual curiosity. Casual, casual curiosity. It doesn't happen through an occasional um, practice. The New York students, and I've said this many times, and I don't mean to compare you or make you jealous, but they would drive hours, literally hours, every weekend to come to sit and do nothing but open and be present. And their commitment made for something very rich, and it's very hard for me to let that go. I love these, I love the New York class dramatically. I love you guys, but you got 20 minute rides to get here, and half the time you're late. Those guys made these three hour, four hour journeys, you know, and as I would tell them, their class was the journey. It was the coming and the, it was the attempt to be there. This class, the richness of this class is you. Your being here, your presence, your hunger makes this work. I will sit here with one person, I'll sit here with nobody. Because it's what I do and because I trust this process as being so essential to life, so essential to what is going on here, and so rare. Where do you go during the week or during the month where people gather to speak of any of this? Where there is presence announcing itself? Where do, if, I mean, if you have places you go, go. You don't have to come. You don't have to come here. But if you have places that you, if you have places that don't fulfill you, that don't give you what you need, this is available. And I would encourage you to be part of it because the hungrier everybody here is, the more we will grow together. So, please, do not be guilty if this is not your hunger. <laughs> do not be guilty. There is no judgment. I love everybody who shows up, and I love everyone who doesn't show up. So don't make this about making me happy, but if it's real in you, bring it. Bring it. It will change your lives. It will give you more than I can even begin to describe. It's everything you're looking for in all the wrong places. This is it. This is the, this is the simple truth. The you that wants to come here is the you that, that you love. It's the you you've been looking for. Whatever it is that gets you out of bed on Sunday mornings, even if your ego mind is fighting it, it's the you that gets you in that car and brings you into this room. Trust that, trust that you, because it's who you are. It's your greatest gift. So, any, any um, questions today? You're in that same spot right now, you said with the blood clot thing? Yeah, right today. Yeah, as of last night, as of mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah, it's, it's a very, um, it, it's a blessing. I mean, I, you know, I hate to deal with medical stuff, and you know, and I don't usually share it with. The, I don't like sharing it with the class, but it's so, it's so immediate. You know, it's so immediate. You just, you just know, like they said, it's really here. That if a piece of that breaks off and goes into this, into anything in you, it's so quick. You know, so they keep the blood thin so that that doesn't happen. And they keep it thin. In my case, it's either going to be for six months or the rest of my life. They, they're trying to figure that one out. Um, because it's happened to me twice now, and, and that's uh, a reason to perhaps be, you know, be attentive. But the incredible thing about getting old, <laughs> hitting 70, and, and, and I have friends who've done that with in, enormously good health, I have had these issues, these things that have come up, but they really do make you a part of the human race. Because hmm. I have had more response from people when I've talked about this stuff than I have when I talk about spiritual awakening. 
people know suffering, health issues, problems, and people don't know what to do with them. And they're looking. And, the, and as you will discover, I hope you don't discover, but as many discover, the medical profession is limited in its ability, ultimately, to keep us alive. They can take you so far and they do some miraculous things, but mostly, one, health is up to you and, and to your DNA, which may not pay attention to, your, you know, to all the weightlifting you do or whatever exercises you do. You, you're going to get what you get. And the important thing is how you react to what you get and what kind of state of being you can be in because it really is the experience of suffering that takes place that is, <coughs> excuse me, a defining element in your spiritual work. You know, how do you, how do you react to, how do you react to pain? It's a real, it's, it's a very big one. For some people, they don't even have to deal with that till the very end, and that's very late in the game to start to figure it out. How, how, how do you do that? But one of the values, if, if that does occur in your life, and I don't exactly wish it on you, but if it does occur, you will learn unbelievably big lessons, and they're very human-centric lessons. They're what, what it means to be alive. And uh, life, life is not just, you know, a paycheck. And it's not just, you know, where can I go on vacation? There's more going on here. And you have to begin to realize that life gets very real. And one of the ways it gets real is in terms of, you know, aging. Aging is dissolution, com contraction. We all go through it. Everyone goes through it. You can go through it over a period of time, or you can go through it like, you know, three weeks, you know. My feeling is, Going through it fast, or let's say you're driving down the road, a car crash. You now have approximately one twelfth of a second to do what we've been trying to do here for 40 years, mm -hmm. <coughs> or however long. Imagine, imagine trying to learn how to let go. Now maybe you don't have to learn it at that point. It just, it just happens. But my experience in timelessness, which is what occurs, is you still got to do it. You still have to disengage from this idea of you and your life. And if you talk to anybody who's gone through um, the death experience, they all talk about the review, the life review. It's exactly what happens. It may not be the way you think, although I've had people tell me it's literally sit down in a room and watch a movie of your life. And find you suddenly stuff comes up and you go, <gasps> you know, oh my God, you know, and that that's exactly where you have to begin to say, okay, I accept that. Most people struggle with whole aspects, the sh elements of shame, elements of should have, could have, would have, all that stuff comes up. You got to deal with that now, because liberation is the reason you're given life is to get it done now. The reason you take form and manifest is because. There's work to be done, and it's very hard to do in the abstract of death, of bodiless existence. It's very hard to do, almost impossible. So the time to do it is here and now. But try to tell that to people. I mean, you know, in the, in the 1600s, it was, you know, fire and brimstone. This is love and joy, you know, it's, but it's, trust me, fire and brimstone exist as well. It's all there. And what you have to do is find a way to accept what is. That's really the entire teaching. Find a way to accept what is. And if you accept what is, you will find truth and freedom. And if you reject what is, if you fight what is, if you don't surrender to what is, you will have to learn how to somewhere along the way. And really, that's what you're going to be taught. And, and, it's, a, and it's, a, it's an important teaching. And, and, the, and the value of the teaching is that when you get there, it's so amazingly wonderful. And that all of this resistance to it is a kind of madness. Why? Why do we fight it so much? Why are we so much at odds with truth? It's the mystery. But it's the journey. We're all on it. Every, everyone here is on it. And, uh, you know... And occasionally you find somebody along the way, I found Rudy, who says, hey, 
there's a path here that winds through it that will free you from eons of, of misunderstanding. Lifetime after lifetime, if that's how it works, of living it wrongly. Getting yourself caught in bigger and bigger traps of your own making. And boy, oh boy, do I watch people do that all the time. You know? And it's hard. It's hard. You know? And we have to make choices in life that often are impossible to make. They're just impossible. What do you do? Accept whatever you do, whatever you choose. Just accept it. That's all. Anyway, I can go on and on, but it is much better to know that this has an ending and you're not here forever than it is to walk, to live in the denial of... I, I, I think it's better. <laughs> What if I may be wrong? For everybody, I may be wrong. Maybe denial, maybe denial is the absolute best choice you can make. And if that's the case, you should go out there and teach it. Teach denial. Ignorance is bliss. True, true bliss. And if that's the truth, then God, you are wasting your time here, and, I, and forgive me. Because, I, I, like I said, it may be true. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for coming. We'll be back here. This, this is the other part of the story. Blanche and I have to close down. It's, we forget it. We have like 22 rooms in that house. Yeah. And they're all full of furniture. Books, DVDs, CDs, antiques, carpets, lighting fixtures. I mean, we have, there's so much stuff that we have to figure out what to do with. And we have to bring some of it here, but as you have anybody who's walked around this house, you can tell there's not, we can't, I can't get another book in this house. I don't know where to put anything. So I'm in the process of pulling stuff out of this house so we have some room to put the stuff from the other house. And it's going to be overstuffed for a while, and then we're going to figure out if we're, if we're staying here or not staying here, if we're going to rent a place up in Seattle. Anyway, it's going to be a crazy time. There will be a lot of stuff being given away, books and things and a lot of stuff that you guys will have access to. I will put it out at some point if, you, if you're looking to acquire, and I don't say that's the best thing in the world to do now that I have acquired so much, but at some point you have to let it go, and I'm happy to let it go to you. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to be, we'll be doing that uh, when we get back. But we'll be back, I think, in October, or maybe a little bit before something might happen, but Blanche is turning 70 in September, at the end of September, so we may come back for her to have a party with her family, our family. <coughs> so, anyway, we probably won't see you this summer, uh, and we'll be back in the fall, and then we'll really be back. So, lots of love to all of you. Thank you.